one week since the British public voted in an historic referendum to leave the European Union. And there are perhaps more questions than ever before about the future of the United Kingdom and of the EU itself. I'm Conor Quinn, and joining me to answer some of those questions is Tom Raines, Research Fellow and Manager of the Europe Programme here at Chatham House. Tom, it was a slim majority, 52 to 48%, but the British people have voted to leave the European Union. Prime Minister David Cameron seems to have accepted this result and has agreed to step down in the coming months. But the referendum result isn't legally binding, and he hasn't triggered Article 50, and nearly 4 million people have now signed a petition calling for a second referendum. So is there any chance that Britain might not leave the European Union after all? So in terms of the legal force of the referendum, as you said, this is not a legally binding result. It's an advisory referendum. We have uh, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty remains, so there's no legal force that the, the vote carries, but, but it does, it, it's effectively political bind, politically binding and it's been accepted as, as such, certainly by, by David Cameron and by uh, pretty much everyone in the Conservative Party. So it's, it's very difficult, I think, to see how the outcome of the referendum could be ignored or overturned without there being a general election to create a, a mandate for a new part for a, uh, a new government which was elected specifically either to hold a second referendum or to reverse the previous decision. I think given how rare referendums are in, in British politics, given how high the turnout was and given actually although it was slim this was still a million vote margin and for that reason it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to renege on the result. Okay, so if the UK is going to leave the European Union, there is the question of when. The leaders of the European Parliament, Council and Commission have called for a speedy exit to reduce uncertainty in the rest of the European bloc. But politicians in the UK seem to want to take more time before they trigger Article 50. So can you tell us briefly what is Article 50 and when we might see that triggered? Article 50 is the process uh, outlined in the EU treaties for how a state withdraws from the EU. There's a few key provisions which it's important to know about. Mm -hmm. The first is that the uh, withdrawal is supposed to come after a proper constitutional process in the withdrawing state. That's important in a British context because it suggests, uh, although this is a legally disputed point, but it suggests that uh, a referendum alone in a British context would not be a proper constitutional process, rather what would be required would be an act of parliament. Now, given that 75% of the parliament currently uh, campaigned to remain, that might create some complications down the line about the timing of Article 50, because it wouldn't purely be in the gift of whomever becomes the next British Prime Minister. Um, in terms of the rest of Article 50, it says that the process for negotiation will be between the withdrawing state and the remaining 27 after the vacation has been given. It sets out a timeline of two years that can only be extended if all the other members of the EU agree to that extension. So the power in the negotiations and the control over the timetable, given that structure, really rests with the other 27 rather than with the UK. Hence the desire to delay things until, until the UK is properly set up. Um, finally, once this withdrawal agreement is agreed, it only needs the majority support of other member states uh, but it also requires the support of the European Parliament, so that may also complicate matters down the line. Boris Johnson, the front-runner to replace David Cameron, wrote in his Telegraph column on Monday that once Britain leaves the European Union, it'll be able to restrict freedom of movement, stop paying into the EU budget, and yet still retain access to the EU single market. How realistic is this best-of-both-worlds scenario? I think not, not very is the simplest way of putting it. The, the Boris Johnson article, which uh, has subsequently, apparently he, he said he wrote slightly in a hurry, in effect, in effect glazes over some of the fundamental contradictions which whoever is, is the next Prime Minister will have to address. There is no country which is a member, full member of the single market uh, and doesn't have, uh, doesn't have to deal with freedom of movement or doesn't have to accept making a contribution to the EU budget. That situation doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, Angela Merkel, who's actually been the EU politician who has probably reacted most calmly to this result and has basically told everyone to, to calm down and to, to take their time, but she's also made it extremely clear um, that that's not an offer which is going to be made to the UK. Uh, the reasons for that are, are quite obvious and it's also the reasons why uh, this wasn't offered to the UK beforehand in the renegotiation, which is that this is part of a package and the entire process of European 
integration has to be based on these compromises that some things are better for or seen as better for, for other states or better reflect their interests and if you want a, a functioning integrated single market people can't pick and choose which parts of those fundamental freedoms uh, that that countries adhere to so at some point down the line a British Prime Minister be it Boris Johnson or whoever else it is is going to have to deal with this contradiction between promising controlled immigration and basically lowering or implied lower immigration from the EU on the one hand and having access to the single market and particularly all, all that means for, for the British exporters and for the City of London. Scotland voted strongly to remain. If the UK leaves, will we see Scotland become an independent state in order to stay within the European Union? Scotland, as you said, voted uh, very strongly to remain. It was uh, quite a long way from, from the result in England, which was actually quite decisively in favour of, of leaving the EU by, by actually almost seven percentage points. Um, in a way, that was, I think, a demonstration of what the argument from the SNP has been all along, which is that Scotland is a distinct political community with a different vision for its future. Um, in a way, it proves the case for, for, for uh, uh, an independent Scotland from their perspective because it shows the two are moving in different directions. So I think that the likelihood of a second referendum in the coming years is very high, particularly if, as, as I expect to happen, the UK does leave the EU uh, in, in the form that it's a member now. And so um, the probability of a second independence referendum is the best way to as the SNP will put it, secure Scotland's position in the EU uh, is very likely. They have always said beforehand in terms of a second referendum that they would accept it only if there was a material change of circumstances in Scotland's position uh, within the United Kingdom. The EU was, was obviously, uh, membership of the EU was obviously regarded as one of those uh, fundamental um, features and in a way Scottish people voted to be members of the United Kingdom whilst it was in the EU. So I think the case is strong. Um, it doesn't, however, deal with some of the fundamental issues which faced the case for independence last time. So particularly that's to do with what happens to uh, use of a currency in future. Uh, potentially you have a situation where um, if the position of the UK Treasury and Bank of England is the same as it was before, which is that uh, an independent Scotland uh, couldn't be part of a currency union with the remainder of the United Kingdom, then potentially the, the Scottish Government might need to move towards using the Euro. Um, that might be a, a significant political hurdle for Scottish voters. The other issue is to do with the uh, fiscal situation in Scotland. Obviously the case for independence was driven in part by the uh, very positive economics of oil production at that point. The oil price was very high. Um, that situation now looks totally different and so the, the challenges for the Scottish public finances uh, of an independent Scotland would be very significant. And so there are still political hurdles which would have to be overcome, but I think the likelihood of a second independence referendum if the UK leaves the EU, um, it will be extremely difficult to avoid, I think. Britain has always had an uneasy relation with, with Europe, but anti-EU feeling is now clearly rising in several other European countries. So what is it that Eurosceptics in Britain and these other countries have in common? You're absolutely right to say that anti-EU feeling is on the rise. The image of the EU and public support for it, uh, it has been quite damaged over the last five years, but even in, uh, by the Euro crisis, by the refugee crisis and the way that's been handled, um, by the, um, the way that the EU and the tensions that have been driven by, by the failures around the single currency, um, in a way, this vote to leave has been a, a shot in the arm to those anti-EU forces in other countries. So in some places, the context is comparable to Britain. We, uh, you know, the UK obviously has a, a distinct history and relationship with the EU, but some of the, the grievances of people on, on the Leave campaign to do with the, the sense that national sovereignty has been undermined, that, that migration from the EU has been excessive and that that has had effects on, on economics and, and, and national culture. Um, those issues do exist in, in a number of other countries, France most obviously, um, as a country with, a, with an important upcoming election, but also in, in several other countries in, in Northern Europe. Um, there's also Euroscepticism in a number of other places driven by other issues or bolstered by other issues. I mean, countries who've, who've had severe austerity driven by their Euro membership, 
there are countries who are, who, who are outside the euro, don't have high levels of inward EU migration, um, but are still quite Euroskeptic. So Euroskepticism is, is, is diverse in that sense, or I even though it has some, some common ingredients across the continent. So if the same forces or, or some of the same forces that cause Britain to vote for Brexit exist in other European countries, are we about to see a wave of, of further exit referendums across the continent? And if so, where? Well, you saw on the morning after the vote the, the jubilation from some of the anti-EU uh, leaders in other countries, uh, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, Geert Wilders in the Netherlands. They called for similar referendums in their own countries. Um, that doesn't mean that they'll get them, but that certainly that ambition is there, and in a way they, they've, they've been inspired by the UK model by seeing what's happened there. The flip side of that is that what you had in the UK that, that allowed this referendum was, was a pro-European mainstream leader who, who took the risk of, of holding this referendum in the first place. And I think most sane pro-EU leaders will look at what happened in the UK and say, this is too big a risk to take. So that leads to the conclusion that you would need an anti-EU party to, to, to get into government somewhere. And that's a much bigger hurdle, particularly in some systems which don't work in the same way as the UK's first-past-the-post system. So it would, you know, in the, the, the more PR system that you have in the Netherlands, for example, would, would set the bar much higher for a, for a, uh, a party to, to get sufficient power to be able to, to force that onto the agenda. So... It is a risk, uh, and I think it will be. It will depend partly on on the forces, the wider forces that affect uh, the direction of European integration. Because the reaction uh, from many of the leaders in these countries, and we've already seen this, will be to try and move forward on other aspects of European integration. If that combines with with perhaps a wider and and toxic political environment, uh, with with a continued struggles and failures to deal decisively with with how Europe manages refugee flows, how it resolves issues ongoing in the single currency, and, and if those are attached to a trigger point, such as the French elections, or there's a referendum in Italy in October on, on a set of constitutional reforms, which, which could, uh, if it's lost by, uh, by Renzi, the Prime Minister, lead to him resigning, those sorts of trigger points might cause a sort of instability which, which, which could, could lead to a, a series of events which which might end up in a referendum. But at the moment, I think a lot of, a lot of mainstream leaders will be, will be probably frightened, or scared off by the, uh, the experience that the UK has had. Tom, there'll be more questions to come, I'm sure, as this story unfolds in the coming weeks. But for now, that's it. Thank you.